Well, um, tonight we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Bryn's journey starting Mirror, and so we're going to talk a lot about entrepreneurship and the leap that it takes to found a business. And we're also going to talk a lot about the way you listen to users and use that feedback to thoughtfully shape the direction of a product. And so if you have questions throughout, please raise your hand. My colleague Jack will jump over. Um, but uh, actually, one last question. Who knows what Mirror is? All right, well, let's, let's start by informing some, uh, some new potential users about what, so what is Mirror. Yeah, um, Mirror is a newly launched uh, fitness technology company. We're building a digital mirror that streams live and on-demand workouts to users in their home. Awesome. And uh, so person purchases a mirror, hangs it on their wall, and the expectation is they're going to use it to work out. Is that like a daily habit, a weekly habit, or your, all your users are, are different? Yeah, I think um, uh, I'm probably different in that perspective. I think a lot of fitness programs are oriented around getting uh, more usage. And we really believe that the sort of key to long-term success is uh, meeting your own expectations for yourself and then hopefully increasing those expectations over time. So we orient around um, a weekly workout target, which is um, then hopefully hit each week. Awesome. And then what uh, flavors do the classes come in? Are they pre-recorded? Are they group classes? Is it one-to-one? -one? Yeah. Um, so we offer basically any type of workout that doesn't involve uh, large cardio equipment. So cardio strength, yoga, Pilates, boxing, bar, and stretch currently. Um, we film every class live, and then it's available on demand in a library. And we also offer one-on-one -on -one personal training, which is a uh, one-on-one uh, live experience. So whatever, whatever folks want, they can get it through their mirror. That's the goal. Love it. Uh, well, actually, let's rewind a little bit. So this isn't your first business that you founded. Um, you previously started a boutique fitness studio. So tell us a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so um, I've been in the fitness space my whole career. I was a professional dancer here in New York at the New York City Ballet and then opened a chain of fitness studios about eight years ago called Refine. Uh, we teach small group high-intensity interval training classes. Um, our kind of differentiator is we build all of our own hardware. So uh, sort of the story there is uh, when I retired from dancing and wanted to open a business, the only studio space I could afford was about 500 feet within a church and every Saturday we had to give the room back to the church for Sunday services and then every Sunday afternoon we took it back and so you couldn't have traditional gym equipment in this space in this strange uh, probably illegal lease arrangement um, so we knew it had to be wall mounted and I knew that I wanted it to have weights because uh, I felt it was important uh, the majority of our clients were female and I felt like there was a lot of um, misinformation around the use of weights for women in fitness. Um, and so we built this contraption out of uh, sailing lines and pulleys and resistance bands. And that became kind of the centerpiece of Refine. That's amazing. So um, one piece of the founder journey that I'm always fascinated by is where your first customers come from. Because I think a lot, it's like the old uh, step one, build the thing, step three, profit, like where's step two. So with uh, Refine, how did you get your first, you know, couple dozen students in the door? What were the channels you used to acquire them? Yeah, I think, uh, I don't know if this is a popular opinion, but my, my personal belief is your first, in the case of Refine, 100, in the case of Mir, 1,000 uh, customers come from any means necessary and completely unscalable means, generally. Uh, so for, for Refine method, it was... Um, really going door to door in our neighborhood, uh, dropping flyers, introducing myself, uh, taking previous clients and uh, inviting them to come to the space. And then they brought friends who brought friends. Um, but we really just thought about each client as being so vitally important at that stage. Um, and I think it's just a, a great way to begin. It's amazing. So uh, you're going door to door selling <laughs> fitness classes. <laughs> yep. Um, with uh, so you get the first Went couple to church. Of, uh, yeah, built an audience right there that helps. Um, so you got your first couple dozen customers in the door. Um, as they like left, did you interview them? Did you survey them to understand their experience and start to? Re I was going to say refine, refine, but that, that's what I meant. Yeah, I'm probably on the opposite end of the spectrum from Claire in uh, that. 
I, I've never had a boss. I've never been part of any larger organization. So I have very little formal training. Uh, so most of our product development has been um, gut rather than system, honestly. Um, so we eventually instituted some client surveys, but initially it was you know, going to dinner with a small group of clients or sitting outside the bathroom and listening to what they were saying. Uh, for the first three years, I answered every client email personally um, just because I wanted to peer and see what people were saying. Uh, I learned how to teach fitness classes, uh, so I was the main instructor for a very long time. Um, so I think just kind of immersing yourself in the product often leads to insights um, that I personally find sometimes harder to glean from, from data. So the, um, the idea of answering every customer's email is one that I've heard reflected in a couple of businesses. So Automatic, which makes WordPress, which powers a third of the web, every new hire does customer support tickets for the first two months of the job. Um, so I'm same curious. Same You do the same? Yep. That's cool. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, well, there's a best practice for you. Uh, I'm curious, what was the, like, what was the, what's the one email that was either because it was tough or it was so insightful, like, what's the one customer email you got in the refined studio days that really changed the course uh, of the business? Uh, gosh. Um, I think it's actually what led to the creation of Mir. Um, I read a client email where she was um, evaluating uh, the upgrades we'd made in our studio spaces in the past year, and she made a kind of often postscript comment about there being more mirrors in the studios and how she thought it was great. Um, and I remember just thinking, like, oh, mirrors. You know, people care about mirrors. I sort of took it for granted as a former dancer. It was just such a part of my, my life and my experience. And we actually did do a survey where we uh, polled all our clients about the upgrades and included the mirrors as one of the line item. And it just destroyed all the other changes we'd made over the past year, um, that mirrors were um, better than the addition of new staff, new classes, new hours, new pricing, anything. It was just the mirrors. Um, and that was kind of the genesis of Mir. Is that, that was like the aha moment for the business? Yeah, um, I just, uh, I personally had been exploring working out in home. I um, was newly pregnant. I had opened my third studio and was starting to think about just myself, how I could work out in my apartment and didn't want to put a bike or a treadmill into my home. I didn't have space. Um, I tried a bunch of streaming apps, but I really didn't like looking at a little screen while trying to exercise and found the act of trying to like search for content on YouTube to be completely counter to the value proposition of working out conveniently, um, just that, the effort, um, and was trying to figure out kind of the means for delivering content to myself. And the, the mirror survey was sort of the realization that the mirror was the perfect portal for content in home. So that's fascinating. So then all right, you have an aha moment. You have conviction that this is something that should exist in the world. I don't know if you have conviction, but I knew I wanted to build it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's probably more important than anything else. Um, so the, how much time was there between kind of that period, that moment, that customer email, the survey, and where we are today? That was about a year and a half or two years? About two years from uh, idea to launch. And then was, in the meantime, were you like iterating on the idea in the background or talking to people about it? Or was this just the sort of thing that was marinating in your subconscious and you just couldn't let go? Um, I think I made a kind of a key decision early in the process that I knew I wanted to raise VC investment. Um, Mirror had been a bootstrapped business, which um, I just think had a lot of implications for us and, and how we were able to grow or not able to grow over the years. And so early on, I kind of uh, made the decision that I wanted to, to raise funds. Um, and so as a result, I think I sort of structured the product development differently uh, than I had with Refine Method because I knew I needed to use personal investment to get from point A to point B. And then from point B to point C, I had kind of a clear path. That's, uh, that's really helpful. So the, you, you commit to building this, and the first thing you do is take money out of your own savings to get started? Yes, again, took my personal savings and <laughs> decided to build something new, yeah. Well, I hope it works out. If it doesn't, you have to sign up for Stash. Um, <laughs> uh, so, what's, uh, so you're investing your own savings into the business. What's the first thing you do? I mean, like, where do you go from a cold start? Do you, are you going for a prototype? Are you hiring a team? Like, what, what are the first one or two things you did to get started? 
Yeah, um, I think I did the opposite of what most people do. I think most people, or common advice is you build something really ugly, but very functional, and then you get you know X number of users, and you do your surveys, and you validate that you'll get to Y number of users. Um, and I did the opposite. I um, built kind of a brand and an experience and faked all the technology to demonstrate kind of the brand and experience and used uh, basically like a, a, an animated video behind one-way glass in like a super janky hardware contraption with store-bought pieces um, to just validate to investors that, the, that I could build the brand and the experience, knowing full well that we'd have to throw out all the tech and start again. Um, and use like an Envision app with, yes. you know, kind of the baseline, love Envision app, uh, the, the baseline product walkthrough, um, but just completely unfunctional. And, and uh, so building this non, let's call it a non-functioning prototype, yep. was this all uh, work you were doing with your own two hands or did you have to recruit in, you know, technical team to help bring it to life? Like what was the team that, that created this anti-MVP? Yeah, um, I think I'm a very big proponent of contract contract help. Uh, we've used a ton of contract help over the past two years and uh, uh, had a software engineer and a hardware engineer who assisted with the first prototype. Excellent. So uh, you get to the, the prototype, and now you are planning to take it into the market. Um, what was the next? Like uh, a lot of things tend to happen in parallel, but did you go out to raise venture financing next, or did you start trying to sell mirrors to uh, potential customers? Yeah, I had, um, so I was eight or nine months pregnant at that point, so I had sort of a, like a practical <laughs> endpoint to the experience, which I knew uh, I had to raise kind of before I gave birth. Um, so raised my, my seed round uh, the day my son was born. Um, oh. I don't recommend that. <laughs> Not a pro tip. Um, <laughs> and uh, then sort of use the seed round to get from non-functional proto to functional proto. Um, we raised our A to get to uh, kind of a production ready brand, um, small quantity, and then raised our B to support kind of like the marketing and team building necessary to launch and get through this next year. Well, congratulations on that whole journey. Um, and uh, when your approach for advice from founders on fundraising, what's the one piece of advice you find yourself consistently giving to other people? Um, just really validate for yourself that your business is a VC friendly business and um, understand what a potential exit could look like for you. And I think engineer backwards from that because there's a lot of uh, great businesses. Refined Method is one of them that are awesome lifestyle businesses or um, businesses that were a $200 million exit might make sense. But um, you have to understand kind of where you're headed, the capital that you need, and the funds that make sense for that journey. It's different. And was there a question that came up in the fundraising process that really pushed your thinking on how to build a business? Like, was there one pattern for, hey, I always have trouble answering this question, or why is everyone always asking me this, or is there like a weakness here? Was there one that you sort of got tired of hearing? <laughs> um, they've changed over the years, I think. Uh, originally it was, don't you need a co-founder, or I'll introduce you to this awesome do you need a co-founder? man <laughs> who would be an awesome co-founder. Um, do you need a co-founder? I don't think so. I, I think it's probably less lonely, but I think... Uh, um, I think there's a lot of pressure to get married to someone for the purposes of having a co-founder in order to raise your first financing, but then you're married to someone you may not want to be married to after that point. So, um, yeah, I think those were kind of the early questions. And um, uh, later on, I think um, a lot of pressure to build a, a different type of product than the product I wanted to build. And I was very fortunate that um, because of kind of my domain experience, I was able to sort of stick to the product that I wanted to build and find investors who believed in that product. That's terrific. And we'll, we'll actually explore product in a second. But I think one step of the journey that we haven't talked about yet is building a team behind you, whether you have a co-founder or not. And uh, as you reflect back on the initial team that you built to bring this idea to life, what's one thing that you think you did really well, whether by design or by accident? And 
flipping that, what's one thing you, in retrospect, are like, oh, geez, I, I kind of screwed that up and <laughs> wish I'd done that differently? Money. Um, I think contract help uh, was essential to us. Um, understanding that the team that we needed for product development was different than the team we were going to need for the long term and being able to access talent that was often uh, more senior, more experienced as a result of a contract or short-term arrangement than we could have um, as a long-term hire. Um, and I think also resisting the urge to um, create uh, crazy inflated titles. So um, we haven't brought on any C-suite folks yet after two years, um, and we've done our best to uh, make it clear to our current team that everyone is doing a job and has a function and titles are going to shift and change. And today, how many people is the org today? Uh, approaching 30 now. 30, okay. What are the um, other cultural values, attributes, like what are the things that you think you look for in people that maybe, you know, not everyone else in the world is looking for necessarily? Like what do you, what do you prize above all else? Um, I'm a former ballerina. I think ballet is kind of unusual in that you kind of show up each day and the goal is to be like slightly less bad than the day before. <laughs> There's no, you don't, you don't win, you don't get any medals, you just try to be less bad. And it's a culture um, where there's this sort of drive to improve and drive to uh, be better um, that I think I uh, gravitate towards in employees. I think uh, Russ would agree that that's a, a valuable attribute <laughs> from earlier. Um, so let's flip a little bit to, to the product lens. So um, does the product today look exactly like you thought it would have three years ago? Uh, Not physically, metaphorically and physically at the same time. Um, uh, I think so. I think it does, honestly. Because um, I think we um, really had a, you know, I've spent a decade really doing this. This is my one thing that I sort of do and I know and this is the customer that I have dealt with and experienced and I personally have lived this problem so acutely. Um, so I think we were, and also being an inexperienced tech founder, we weren't really able to build more than <laughs> kind of the minimum to serve this client and this problem. Um, so I think what we've been left with is something that does look very much like um, the first proto. Uh, that's amazing. And then do you, if you're giving advice to a fellow founder, I think a lot of founders wrestle with this idea of, do I um, execute the vision that I had at the start of the business? Or do I listen to the data, the customers, the investors, whoever else might be telling me to do something different? Um, where would you fall on that spectrum? I think, uh, I think you have to know what the feedback will be and be practical about... Um, the need to raise capital and you're, you're selling the product to lots of different audiences. And so you'll have to sell it to an investor audience as well as a consumer audience, as well as a team audience. And you can't um, be blind or willful to that fact. So we've built some things that I felt were important for press or for investment that were maybe not critical to our customer, but we prioritize them first in order to be able to, to build the business. Um, you told me about one of those features earlier. You mentioned a feature that you'd built that resonated loudly in a fundraising context, but actually few of your users are taking advantage of. What was that feature? Yeah, um, an exercise we did that I think is super helpful is um, we built our, or I sort of sketched out our website very, very early in the development process because I wanted to be able to say, this is the feature, uh, these are the, you know, here are the things we're building and the value props attached to them and feel confident that we were building something that I could sell to someone. And uh, one of those features was um, basically an algorithm that uh, feeds you workout videos, substitutions and regressions based on injury. Um, so when you do your in onboarding process, you tell us if you have a knee injury or back injury, and then we'll, in real time, give you um, exercise modifications. Um, so when, you know, when personal trainers or um, investors come and see it, it's always a crowd pleaser. Um, but clients um, don't care about it. <laughs> Many of them turn it off. So, <laughs> which we, I think, sort of knew, but um, just understanding that from the consumer perspective, they would rather have a trainer tell them what to do or do what they want to do themselves for their own body than to feel like there was some algorithm that was modifying things for them. That, um, 
That's interesting. And the other, the other thing we were talking about earlier that really stuck with me is we're talking about the choice between using data to guide product decisions or the choice to use um, feedback or qualitative feedback to, to guide product decisions. You made it sound like you are very heavily on the qualitative feedback side. Um, I think perhaps because I'm not as skilled with data as Claire is. Uh, <laughs> I, I think just... Uh, my, my inclination from having spent the first part of my career speaking to clients just every day, all day, is if I see data that feels off to me, my inclination is to say, we've asked the wrong question. What question have we asked? How do we go back and fix the question? Um, and make sure that that's correct uh, before prioritizing data over kind of what we're hearing from customers. And so... This is interesting. So the early, in the early stages of the business, you probably had your, well, you did have uh, the significant audience you built up through the studio business. You were able to solicit feedback from them. Mm -hmm. What did you, so you, it sounds like you did a survey. Did you also do a lot of in-person interviews? Like what were, the, what were the ways you drew input from them that really helped shape the direction of the product? Um, honestly, we struggled with this a lot because our product is so complicated. You know, we have custom hardware, software, and content. And the points in the development in which we needed feedback, our product, I think, fundamentally wasn't functional or attractive enough to elicit good, useful feedback. So um, we went through a period where we tried to sort of do user testing and interviews and surveys and things, and just felt like we kept getting um, just bad information because people were evaluating it based on how pretty the product was versus being able to put themselves into kind of the end state of where we were headed. Um, so for our product, uh, kind of early feedback was, like in response to the product, was less useful than just um, talking to people and kind of understanding their, their pain points. So you just spoke a little bit about the beauty of the product being important uh, to its success. So first of all, congratulations, the product is stunning. Like I would load up one of the articles, it Thanks. just looks amazing. Um, how did your design team, or how did you go about figuring out what a mirror should look like? And like, because I, I have to imagine there's an odd challenge where it can't just look like any old mirror. It has to look like a special magic mirror. So, how did you? What in, inspiration did you draw? Um, how did you go down the path of figuring out that you nailed it? So talk a little bit about that journey. Yeah, I think we we did two things. Um, one very practical, which I recommend for anyone building hardware, which is we'd heard so many horror stories of people going through all these uh, divine design phases and then going to manufacturing and having the manufacturer say, we can't build that or it's too expensive or investing in huge molds that then break. And um, so I went backwards. We uh, went to manufacturers with like a napkin sketch and said, how would you build something that looks like this? Um, and then kind of worked backwards with the manufacturer to land on a design. And we had just kind of guiding principles. Um, I was just obsessed with the thickness of the item, <laughs> like obsessed. Uh, how, wide, how thick is the mirror? Uh, it's 1.4 inches. <laughs> I wish it was one inch or less, but it is not. Um, to the point where I was like taking a hacksaw to the back of the panel inside to see if I could get a little more um, depth. But... We had like a couple key things that we felt were essential for it being something you wanted to put in your home, and we prioritized those throughout the process. And then other things like um, cost efficiencies, frankly, we just didn't. So what are things that are essential for the mirror to accomplish to be eligible to be put in some? What are those things? Yeah, I mean, I think for some people, you know, people on in the hardware land were very obsessed with... Um, materials or weight and kind of early on I just said this is going to be white glove delivery and install it could be 400 pounds and it doesn't matter so we're not going to optimize for those things um, but for me having a, a, a basically an invisible frame such that it could work in any home environment was essential so we did a lot of work to make the glass look like it floats in the frame um, which is very unusual for a mirror. Most mirrors have a frame that kind of wraps around the front edge. And uh, as you look to the future, actually I read an interview with you where you said this is uh, the long-term vision for mirrors. It's not a, a treadmill and a mirror. 
This is portal into the home. Can you, I'm paraphrasing, can you expand a little bit on, on what you meant by that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, that's kind of like the North Star a little bit. So uh, we sort of view the, mu the mirror as the next screen in your life. So you have your iPhone for small informational content. You have your television for entertainment. And then your mirror is for immersive interactive experiences. And we think there's kind of a whole uh, in the home space for another screen, but one that doesn't demand that you change your decor, change your environment to be a screen. Um, so for us, we view fitness as kind of the first vertical and the most natural vertical because uh, it makes sense to do it at home. There's the privacy, the convenience, um, and it's also a subscription business model. People are used to paying for a monthly gym subscription, um, but that there's uh, the ability to expand into other content verticals. You're presented with a unique opportunity and a very unique challenge because if you do what you've set out to do, you've now got um, you know uh, dozens of inches of screen space in millions of homes around the U.S. and the number of opportunities that just are sitting right in front of you must feel unlimited. Yep. So, how do you actually prioritize what you're going to do next? NPV model? <laughs> if I can figure it out. <laughs> um, no. Um, I think that's the current struggle, honestly. Um, and it's a struggle because sometimes you have to, I think, just try something and execute at 40% just to see how the experiment goes. So we're doing a bit of that, uh, saying yes to things with the caveat that we're going to, it's it's going to be a sloppy beta and that's going to be okay. Um, so we've been doing a bit of that. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's the current challenge, what to prioritize. It certainly sounds like an exciting challenge. Um, so actually, we're running down on time, so I'd love to start opening it up to audience Q&A. Uh, Jack is over here with the microphone, and we've got one in the back. Hi. Is there any two-way communication in, in, in the roadmap, and you know, especially given the recent obsession with privacy? Are you, is this a data play? Are you going to tell Nike that... 55% of your users wear their outfits. That's that kind of stuff. Wow, you're hired. Um, <laughs> um, that was tricky for us because we knew we wanted a camera in the device because we felt that two-way communication was um, important for being the, the next screen in someone's home. But we also did not want to over-engineer the camera. So we didn't want uh, like a connect style limb tracking, repetition counting um, experience. We didn't feel like that was important for our core user. Um, and we also didn't want to take on building all the features that the camera would utilize for launch because it wasn't part of our core experience. Um, so that's been kind of a messaging challenge that we have a camera in the device that currently um, is only used for a feature that's in beta, which is our personal training. Um, and I think the biggest thing around that is uh, we have a physical cover. <laughs> we have a lens cap, which um, goes a long way for people feeling comfortable having something in their in their bedroom. Um, and then we follow kind of traditional fintech style like authentication processes. So you have to have your phone, your mirror, there's passcodes, there's pin pairing. Um, maybe down the line it'll be heart rate based authentication, I don't know. Um, but we, we sort of do our best to uh, kind of follow best practices there. Hi, do you see this becoming a platform for other developers to come on to and develop kind of apps that are different from your own vision? Yeah, I think if we're doing our job right, you know, two years from now, we'll be making maybe 50% of the content on Mir. Um, I think we're uh, more like the app store and that, you know, your phone comes with Safari and the phone app and then there's a pretty stringent process if y'all have gone through it to get your app approved um, to be on the platform. So I think we're hoping to have like a layer of curation uh, that goes into things that come onto our ecosystem. So we're not orienting towards kind of YouTube open marketplace, but um, more of a curated model. So one thing I thought of, uh, we had the VP of design from Strava at last uh, month's design driven. Yeah. And he had a very nuanced view to the um, how to leverage social in a fitness context. I'm curious what your philosophy, I guess, is on um, competition, support, challenges. Like, what, what's the mere uh, opinion on making exercise social? 
Yeah, I think uh, this is an area where I diverge from the majority and um, maybe can only get away with from having taught people. Um, I think that uh, community looks very different for our target user who is uh, in home and frankly often a bit older than most social users, you know, 35 to 45 and up. Um, so for us, it's about making our user feel like they're not alone and that it's that their showing up matters, um, but it's not about um, people showing up synchronously. Um, which I think is hard for people to wrap their mind around if they're used to going to boutique studio classes with their friends and making a date. And um, so we've deprioritized things like feeds and chat and stuff like that because um, we, we don't think that's important to our core demo. Um, and I feel kind of the same way about competition with others, frankly. You know, I think there's... 1% of the market that will wake up and get on their bike or their treadmill every day no matter what and um, is interested in metrics and benchmarking against the larger community. Um, and then there's 99% of us. And I think even the 1% has 99% moments. And for them, I think it's about really personal benchmarking. So you want to know that you're making forward progress, which can be done um, through kind of lightweight data. Um, but it's not about dumping as much information on someone as that you possibly have and then hoping that they kind of sift through it. I think that's really for like a very small subset of our audience, but that is the Strava audience, certainly. And they're a great user because they will always show up. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Brian. First of all, congratulations. Uh, the product looks great. It's on my Christmas present list. Um, so my question is kind of a follow-up on what you're talking about. The biggest challenge in marketing with this model is there's the beginning novelty and then the customer retention is where it's all about. So what has been the journey like for your customer and sort of what are the battles you've been tackling? Yeah, that's... Uh yeah, it's a new product and a new category, and it's super complicated. I, I'd be surprised if even all of our investors could describe what our product does <laughs> to other people. Um, so for us, that's mean has meant doing things offline earlier than we would have in our life cycle, I think. Um, so right now we're exploring retail. Uh, the day we launched, we had users in our office doing demos. Um, so we know it's an experiential product that you kind of have to see to believe and understand, um, which is, I think is unique. We can't really rely on kind of the like test and learn Facebook iteration strategy you would often get at this stage. Um, so it's a challenge. Yeah. So I think this will be our last question of the night. Second to last question of the night, a little bit of a softball. Are you hiring right now? Yes. What are you Always. hiring? Everything. Everything, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last. Hey, uh, when you're in that scrappy seed stage, how do you validate and prioritize content and software and hardware? It sounds like a really big challenge. And were you ever have pressure to like drop one of those three things? And how did you approach that whole process? Yeah, um, I learned about a, a new a role that exists in tech world called project manager. And <laughs> that was what we were, we were missing, but they exist. Um, I would have hired someone like that earlier. I think I ended up being kind of project manager. Um, but I think a lot of it is uh, getting someone to own kind of that cross-silo road mapping and being really um, just diligent about tasks and timelines in a way that you have to be when you have a physical product. And it's just completely different than software. Um, so yeah, you, you just, you just got to look farther ahead. And just to riff on that a little bit, so you do have software, you have the content, and you have the hardware. Yeah. What has been the hardest of the three to tackle? I think it just goes through phases, honestly. Um, we resisted for a really long time building a live, product, live streaming content because I don't think people fundamentally interact with live content live, um, which has frankly been validated by our users. But there was something about the content being filmed live that gave it um, just a life that we just couldn't capture when we were filming on demand. So we, very late into our um, kind of life cycle, just built a live production studio in our office, um, which means, you know, figuring out how to build a soundproof box next to all your desks and all that great stuff. Um, and then, of course, you know, hardware and software have their own challenges. That's fair. Uh, all right, and we'll end on this note. So uh, what is the piece of advice you've been given in your career that's stuck with, the stuck with you the most, whether 
your dance career, the st studio career, and now in this um, uh, venture back tech startup. What's what's the piece of advice that stuck with you throughout that journey? Gosh. I think since my area is fitness, maybe I'll stick with that. Uh, <laughs> can I get it above my, my pay grade? Um, someone told me once that you should treat your body like it belongs to someone you love, um, which I think is um, just a wonderful guiding principle for any choices you make in, in health and fitness and in life. That's an amazing night, note to end on because we're about to have beer and pizza. So. <laughs> <laughs> that fits. Thank you for that. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks.